people can discover fighting games in a variety of ways. For me, it was my mom taking me to arcades in the early 90s and discovering titles like Street Fighter 2 and Fatal Fury. For others, watching events like Evo may inspire someone to pick up a controller and push some buttons. For a lot of people though, their first experience with fighting games may come from Core A Gaming. For years now, Gerald Lee has been making some of the best content in not just the fighting game community, but on YouTube as a whole, breaking down fighting games in his analysis videos and making them digestible and relatable to the masses. During my trip to EVO Japan earlier this year, I had a chance to swing by Seoul and talk to Gerald on the eve of opening his team's new event space and studio to talk about his beginnings and his process behind making videos. I found out about fighting games basically like a lot of other people at the arcades. The arcades were an awesome place to be because that was the place where they had games with the best graphics and the, the best sound and the, just the best technology in gaming, right? There's no like trailers or anything, you can't go on YouTube, so the arcades were kind of a place where it's like, you know, you find out about games there. <laughs> If you ever have a conversation about fighting games with somebody who's into the games as much as you are, you get into these kind of nerdy conversations that really kind of dissect what the game's about, how they work. Originally, these conversations just come from like, oh man, like, you know, that guy threw me and like, it was like, throws are instant, like as soon as they get up and there's nothing I can do. You have to realize that, you have to find that out as you're learning the game so that you can, um, you know, avoid that pitfall next time. So. People always talk about Okizeme, right? The idea of Okizeme attacking someone on someone's wake up. And that's a really big part of these games, right? How they kind of work. I like to have conversations with people about the game and then you, you just get deeper as you, you find out more stuff. A lot of my content in my videos, I generally don't want it to seem like, oh, this is a video about game development. I think there's definitely a link between learning more about the game, getting better at it, and then understanding game dev mentality at the same time, whether you know it or not, right? I think there's a link there. The reason why Street Fighter II's stun mechanic caused so much salt was because it violated the concept of need so badly. You're already doing bad because your opponent is constantly hitting you, but then the game says, because you did so bad, now you don't get to move or defend yourself. Now watch as you get your ass beat more. Now I've been living in Korea since about 2011. Obviously there's a, there's a cultural difference between the US and, and Korea and even between other Asian countries. There's definitely a gaming culture here. It's one of the few countries in the world where professional gamer is a household name, for example. So I know there are a lot of famous professional gamers in other countries, but it's hard to mention one of these players to random people you don't know and expect them to be like, oh yeah, I know that player. Or, you know, tell your grandmother about this esports player, right? You know, obviously in Korea, StarCraft was huge, and you know, Slayer's Boxer is one of those players that like you can actually mention to pretty much anybody in Korea, and they'll know who that is just as much as somebody will know who Brad Pitt is, for example, right? So for fighting games, it's a, it's a little bit different because uh, Korea kind of, you know, took off with the, the whole PC gaming stuff, right? So, you know, that's why Korea is known for like League and, and Overwatch and, and StarCraft, but when it comes to fighting games, yeah, there was an arcade scene here in Korea. Obviously, Tekken is one of those games where a lot of people grew up playing. And so there's a lot of good competitive players coming from Korea. Because there's kind of like a professional gaming culture in Korea, you can, you can tell like the players do realize this and they want to try to uh, expand their careers. So this is kind of a thing where if you were to explain to your parents, they would kind of get it, right? In, in Korea, you have a, a lot of famous people who have become professional gamers. It's just kind of a thing, right? Whereas I think maybe in some other, other places where it's not as prevalent, it might be a little bit harder to explain, you know, like, what do you do? It's, uh, you play, play games for a living, like, like video games, like, just move your thumbs, you just press buttons and make money. Like You don't have to explain yourself in the way that you might have to in other places. If you've seen a Core A gaming video before, you know it's a powerful combination of editing, timing, and lots of research. Videography and editing is a skill that's honed and very rarely polished overnight. Just how did Gerald get into video production and how much goes into making a Core A gaming video? So when I was young, um, I'd say probably around college age, I played a, around with cameras a lot. Uh, I watched a lot of films and um, I actually started making a little bit of money from uh, wedding videos. 
And from that, we kind of got into filmmaking. Now I'm doing it professionally. Me and a, a few friends, we pulled our equipment together when, uh, in Korea and we formed a company that makes uh, video content for you know, corporations or events or uh, not weddings. We don't do weddings anymore, thankfully. Uh, when you're running a video business, sometimes you don't get a lot of business and you have to be creative and find other ways to make money. Um, so during our like um, low seasons, uh, we'd make our own content. And that's when I was like, oh, how about you know, a gaming channel, Corey Gaming, right? And um, I just started chasing well-known fighting game players and just making um, interviews and content through them. Eventually I did, uh, did my first analysis video, the one with the really clickbaity title. That had a really good reception. Like it seemed like a lot of people do like to kind of nerd out about these kind of games. And, and that was during a time when esports was kind of becoming a thing. It's now a part of um, our company in a way. And movement matters because your positioning determines if an attack will reach or not. While you can't move your head like this in most games, you can move your feet. When you form a strategy based on movement and striking ranges, you have what people like to call footsies. Originally, the way I approached analysis videos was basically, there'd be a lot of like maybe current events or stuff that people are talking about, right? And I would, you know, have these conversations with people and, you know, they'd be really interesting conversations. And then, and then when you have a conversation with people, sometimes you're like, oh wait, let me check that. You know, you look at your phone and then you end up doing research kind of automatically, right? When that happens, like I get a lot of interesting insights and information from just these conversations that I have and I, I make a video about it. You can see what people are interested in just by how they respond to, you know, the conversation, right? Sometimes they find it really interesting, they'll start throwing in like their insights and sometimes they'll have really good insights and, and it's like, wow, this should be, you know, a piece of content. Sometimes there'll be uh, something that I want to explain or uh, a topic like obviously the why button mashing doesn't work video is, is kind of how you know the base fundamentals of fighting games work. But that video was originally not about that. That video is actually um, a video about Punch Planet. It's an indie fighting game that I like a lot. When I was making that video, I wanted to explain like why I, I like this game. And I, I realized like it's, I mean, you can kind of talk about like, oh, I kind of like the art style or I like this, or you know, I like how they made the, a canceling system, much more intuitive. You can talk about that kind of stuff, but like I was really kind of trying to get at the, the base fundamental reasons of why I'm enjoying this game and playing it a lot. And then you get to, you know, the idea of how Oki's MF, Footsie's, anti-airs, you know, that kind of stuff work, right? And I was like, I was like, you know, talking about this, I was like, okay, I had, now I have to talk about this stuff. And then the video is no longer about the game. It was just about like talking about these core concepts, right? And so I had a lot of stuff written about like these core basic concepts. I'm like, this is totally getting out of hand. And I realized, wait, this is kind of a video about how these games, you know, fundamentally work, right? I later realized that this is kind of like, this is what those people who always say, you know, fighting games are just a bunch of button mashing need to know, right? To know that it's not button mashing, right? That's when I realized like, okay, this will be, this can be that video to explain it. It'll be the best video ever to explain to somebody why fighting games are not really just a bunch of random button mashing, right? And it'll be something that people can understand. And mashing in a driving game would probably look like you were really drunk. It's obvious why it doesn't work in those games because random button mashing is the video game equivalent of violently flailing your limbs. That's why it kind of makes sense that people button mash in fighting games. Most people don't know how to fight in real life. Violent limb flailing might be a good strategy for beating your younger brother or sister, but everyone knows that this is far from martial arts mastery. You just kind of talk about like how these concepts work at a deeper level in a way that they can relate to. So obviously I use a lot of martial arts in my videos because people can, anyone can relate to like boxing or something, you know, they, they know what it is to dodge someone's punch or be out of their range or know, you know, almost everybody knows that if you're a boxer with a certain reach, you know, you have a certain advantage. Like you don't have to be an expert, right? So when you use these concepts to, to make analogies to fighting games, it really opens up a, a new understanding for people. And I think that's something that's really useful for people as well. Um, people who are learning or people who want to help other people understand these kinds of concepts because fighting games in, in general are not very intuitive in a lot of respects. So, but I also think that just because it's not intuitive doesn't mean that there isn't something interesting 
worth learning about. I spend um, months writing a video, and sometimes I have an idea that I come back to like a year later. Editing and making the graphics, and that's usually pretty quick for me. But yeah, when it gets to the editing phase, I can have a lot of fun with uh, After Effects and putting silly jokes and memes in there. The challenge with my videos are just, how do I get my point across? How do I get people to understand these ideas? It gets harder and harder to make good content, right? And you don't want to always do the same thing, but, but then when you go into new territory, that's also a little bit scary. I think a lot of people struggle with that. And then you kind of think about results and like um, you think about like views and hits. You know, like what if my next video doesn't get as many hits as the last one? That stuff will drive you insane, right? I was talking with a friend about the YouTube algorithm. And I was mentioning something like, if I did this in my video, I don't think the YouTube algorithm would, would favor me. And he was like, Gerald, why are you making a video for an algorithm? You're making them for people, right? That's when it became really clear that like, that's something you, ha you can't lose focus of, right? These videos are for people to enjoy. <laughs> You know, like if you keep on making your video for any other reason, if you're focusing on other things that's not about making videos for people to watch, then your content just gets compromised in a lot of ways, right? A lot of people ask me like, oh, how do you know what's the right length for a video, right? And I never think about length. As a matter of fact, I've had entire videos, analysis videos that I would make, and I just never, I still to this day don't know how long they are. Like people will ask me, like, I, I don't know. That's not really important. That's like length is kind of one of those things. It's like if you made a video too long, you just didn't edit well enough. Like you left stuff in there that shouldn't have been in there, right? Um, but then like the idea that your content should be short, that means that you're, you're not confident that the stuff that you do have is valuable, right? So what is the happy, what is the right amount? The right amount is what you think is valuable and you just keep that in and if it's not valuable, you leave that out, right? And back in the, the old days, you have to kind of conform to like television standards. You have to have like a 20 minute episode for a 30 minute block, 10 minutes of commercials or whatever. But nowadays you don't have to do any of that. So like you can have a piece of content and as long as it's, as long as it needs to be, no more, no less, then you have that sweet spot, right? A day after my interview with Gerald, Core A Studios had a soft opening for their new event space, which also doubles as their new production office for their video business. How and why did this idea come together? A lot of things kind of aligned perfectly to make this happen. We've been running a video production company for a while, but we've always needed like a bigger studio space, right? We've, we used to have like a super tiny, dingy office. I think it, it might have appeared in a few of, uh, few of my videos, but it's a very small office where you really couldn't do much. And we would record like audio stuff like in the bathroom with like audio foam everywhere. It was like not really the, the most professional environment, but they've always wanted to kind of expand, but it's expensive to have a bigger place and, you know, to have a decent location. And so um, there never really was the be a good excuse to, to make that happen, right? Fast forward a bit and I found out about these tech and dojo events where you can do an event and still be able to award points to the players who went to qualify for the the finals, which is amazing, right? You suddenly, like, if you are a grassroots event, if you can hold an event with enough people, um, you'll be awarding points to, to people, pro players who depend on it, right? So now all these top players have an incentive to go to these events. It kind of um, opened up some new possibilities, right? Basically, what ended up happening was I knew this tournament organizer uh, named Josh. He basically has been running some of the biggest Smash events in in Korea and um, you know I've I've seen him at some of these events and uh, you know I've gotten to know him I saw that his head was definitely in the right space for these kind of kinds of things he wanted to make player focused tournaments kind of tournaments more uh, in the vein of like combo breaker and stuff like that and I, I'm always jealous that the US has like events like that like these super awesome events and I contacted Jinhee from UYU we made this event called Peacekeeper I looked at dojo events in Korea. I was just like, wow, there's really not that many. <laughs> Some regions, they have like an endless amount of these dojo events, but I looked at Korea, it's just like so few. I'm like, this is like a Tekken, you know, country, right? It's like, there needs to be more of these kinds of events, right? A ton of people showed up. Um, you know, we maxed out the venue. 
So Josh, the tournament organizer, has a team that's known as A Day Studios. Their team teamed up with us, Core A. Now here at Core Studios, we're doing you know events together, right? And of course, to do that, you need a bigger venue. That's when I realized, okay, we need um, our own space to do what we want, and that finally gave an excuse to making a studio, right? So I was like, all right, well, if these events can, you know, bring enough to at least, you know, make up for part of the rent, and the video production side will make up part of the rent, then we'll be able to afford a bigger space, right? We're going to have events at night, uh, in the evening. But in the day, we're going to be an office that makes video content for companies. And of course, because we have this gaming event thing, that's going to help the video production company because uh, we can produce content for, you know, esports, right? Or, you know, FGC, whatever you want to call it. And it's kind of making it a sustainable thing. So one of the goals with this place, you have 20 setups. Uh, we have like a bar. I did all the, the paperwork. I'd, I took the uh, four hour long food course and the fire safety course and got all the certifications and everything. And uh, we're all up to code now and we're gonna open soon. This was kind of like um, a big thing I wanted to try and do so that there could be a sustainable place in Korea that specializes in this sort of thing. It was also a big investment on my part. And uh, it's a, it, it is a big investment on you know a lot of the people who are putting all this uh, effort into this this sort of thing, but uh, if we can make it sustainable, then it'll make our video company more sustainable too, and they'll help each other. And that's kind of one of the goals with this place, so. With a successful channel and a new home, Core A Studios is ready to embark on a new chapter for themselves. What do the next five years look like for Gerald and the team? Five years down the line, I, I still want to be playing enjoyable fighting games, meeting new people, and just getting good games, and watching good games, and ultimately that's, the main thing I just want to keep on doing in terms of like aspirations for how big do I want the channel to become or or how big do I want uh, you know these events to get I mean obviously like if they got big that's cool and everything right but I guess the most important thing is like that it maintains the quality of the content and the events maintain the quality that Josh and, and team have been putting out and you know when I talk to him I, I'm not worried about it for a second he's he's always uh, focused on making um, really good player focused events we can do this in a, in a million different ways, but you do have like certain values that you don't want to give up when you're doing these kinds of things. And you get inspirations, right, from certain people, the way they're doing it. And of course, these, these, the values I'm talking about are not like, you know, like, you know, about morals or ethics or anything. The values I'm talking about are more like, what do you think makes good content? What do you think makes good events? You know, what, what makes the FGC like good and special? What makes it valuable? What makes it worth spending all your time and sometimes money, you know, what makes it worth it? And you just focus on that as best as you can without going broke. That's, that's basically, that's as simple as that. Just focus on, on your passions uh, and uh, don't, you know, kill yourself doing it. Thanks for watching our feature with Gerald on Quarry Gaming. Obviously this feature was filmed before the COVID-19 outbreak really hit its stride, so the situation has changed. You can hear more about how Gerald and his team are adjusting to things over on Sage Amp's new podcast. And also be sure to follow Gerald and his team at Corey Gaming or Corey Events on Twitter to get their latest updates. When things do settle down, I do plan to go back to Korea and do a follow-up feature with Gerald and Josh. But until then, stay safe. Our videos are 100% crowdfunded and made possible by our patrons, like these guys. As well as our special contributors, Radiance and Equinox. If you'd like to support our work, consider becoming a patron today at patreon.com slash holdbacktoblock. Until next time.